I'll see and hear me properly. I always wanted to say that post pandemic, but um, in, in the virtual room, I hope everyone can see and hear me properly. Uh, so today I will be talking about a uh, case study on uh, one year of electronic literature India uh, that I facilitated with my amazing colleagues back home one year ago during the pandemic. Before I move on, I would like to elaborate a little bit about how it came into being. So uh, I discovered electronic literature initially not as, as an academic pursuit, but as something more creative, so as to speak. I remember when I was in school, like six years ago now, uh, in class 11, as we call it, and uh, I was supposed to submit this article to be published in the magazine. But then later on, it didn't get published, and I remember that I cried a lot this evening. And then it came to my head that why don't I open this thing called a blog and uh, share it with my students and annoy them to death to read it really. So that is how my blog started. It has a very funny name called The Penarchist, which means pen plus anarchy. And I have been uh, uploading their uh, random stuff for the last five years. It is like 80 entries now. Now, when in 2019, December, I went into this workshop at IIT Gandhinagar, uh, which is one of the Indian Institute of Technologies. I work at IIT Jodhpur as a PhD scholar, and that is another IIT which that Gandhinagar is in Uh There was this workshop on digital humanities, which was called Winter Institute in Digital Humanities. Uh, so there I met a number of scholars, practitioners, and uh, theorists, etc. And I came to know upon further exploration that there is something called electronic literature. And when I came to know about that, I was like, hang on, I was doing this from my bedroom years ago. Maybe not the way it exists, but in a different sense of the term. And then with my further engagement, I discovered the ELO and all of you, and this moment has led to the culmination of a chain of events that has proceeded thus far. But, but then I realized that there is no community per se So there is no community per se that can channel this scholarship, thought, engagement, be it in electronic literature, digital writing, digital narrative, whatever you want to call it. I say electronic literature, digital literature, or what you will be. There was no community regarding this. And I decided that it is time that we had a community of sorts to channel the scholarship in certain senses. Uh, what is to be the outcome of it and what is to be the posterity of it is, is a later concern that I'll come to later on. But then the question becomes, I call this something called communities of communities, something that I talked about at uh, the last DHSI that happened. Uh, so uh, what I did was I, yeah, what I did was uh, I was doing my master's thesis then, and I was doing a survey for my master's thesis uh, to identify what is the status and why do people write on the digital space in India. Now that is a different tangent of conversation something that I may not be able to delve in uh, mm -hmm. in detail. Uh, so at the end of a survey, being very uh, rather uh, uh, indulgent, I added another survey saying, if you want to become a part of this organization that I am trying to build, really, you can fill up this another form. And that form was filled by 15 odd people or 18 odd people, I'll come to that later on, and that is how the group began. And then the question was, if we are about to have a group, where do we have the group? Because uh, platform politics in the digital space is, is a conference in itself, not in Como, perhaps somewhere else. Uh, now, that was a problem. Because in India, uh, when we, I even I, I talk about Dharti, the Digital Human Health Alliance for Research and Teaching Innovations, we have also been experimenting with a lot of different platforms. And I have seen DHSI and other conferences, especially during the pandemic, with conference hosting platforms came up in plenty from Hopin and Basecamp, etc., etc., having different purposes, mind you. And then in the survey also, I gave like some options that where do you want it to be? Uh, Twitter, Discord, WhatsApp, uh, Slack, this, that. The support for WhatsApp and Discord was an outstandingly high number. Now, there may be certain concerns in certain parts of the world, I understand, regarding personal messaging services like WhatsApp, WeChat, uh, Telegram, etc., etc. But it is important to be noted that in a, in a space like India, WhatsApp is the 
mode of communication that is used and it is not an understatement by any stretch of the imagination. It is the app that you use for all sorts of communication right from talking to your head of the department in a departmental group chat to talking to your mother if you have had your meal at night in a foreign country. Everything is done through WhatsApp. And this group also started its existence on WhatsApp in itself with those 15 to 18 odd people. Now, of course, 15 to 18 people cannot sustain a group. I needed more engagement, more people, more voices, if you will. Then what I decided to do something that I term as communities of communities is that I looked up to my peer organizations in some of, of like, uh, let's say, ancillary fields of engagement. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Leo. Uh, so, ancillary fields of engagement. Number one, being uh, an organization of which I am an executive committee member of at this point, the Digital Humanities Alliance for Research and Teaching Innovations, which is which is a uh, digital humanities body in India because we don't prefer the term the. Uh, so, there I discovered that many people have this inclination, but if there if there is a need of a platform, and then comes Digra India, which was initially Game Studies India, led by Dr. Shovik Mukherjee, of course. Then it, become, it became the Indian chapter of DIGRA, the Digital Games Research Association. So I used these two groups, also existing in WhatsApp, mind you, to pool the resources to bring people to another group. Because in WhatsApp, we say, we have a joke, oh my god, another group, really? Uh, we don't have friends in life as, as much as we have groups in WhatsApp, but that is not a uh, point of discussion. Uh, so we used these two groups to form another group, so community from communities. Now, why do I have a COVID virus thing doing, which is a really irritating thing to be on the screen right now? It is because the community was formed at the height of the pandemic. The second wave in India was deadly. You may have all seen pictures of bodies floating in the, in, in the rivers and, and there not being enough place to bury people. I don't want to bring those visuals again because it might be triggering. It was so deadly that in all of these groups, we suspended academic activities and we said that we are not going to be doing anything academic. What were we doing then in an academic group, you ask? Uh, what we were doing is, if anyone needed oxygen cylinders, if anyone needed a vacant hospital bed, they were giving the calls in these groups and we were spending day and night to look at lists and empty hospital beds and available oxygen cylinders in the community and pulling those resources back to the group saying, hey, there is an empty cylinder, there is a cylinder, do you want to refill it, do you want to get it, do you want to, uh, there is a bed, do you want someone, do you want it for someone? So the point here is not just academics, it goes beyond academics because in academics I think it is very important not only know when to work but also when to not work. All right, now that is one very important way of forming a community, that is to bring people together and voices and to make them a part of the discourse. But there is a larger reason to form a community, a reason that goes beyond the electronic literature, digital humanities, or any disciplinary boundaries that you may talk about. And I am talking about my Indian context here, these barriers. And I did talk about it previously for the Ireland and UK DH uh, meet that we had in 2021 as well. Number one is anxiety. Because what I see here is undergraduates, postgraduates, early career PhD students attending such a lovely conference here at such a lovely venue. For me, when I was doing my UG, it was unimaginable even to go to a conference, let alone speak there. But I did it anyway. Uh, because it is suppose the mentality that prevails and i'm not going to name anyone or an institute because there are varying degrees of pedagogic engagement is that one is just supposed to read the syllabus prepare certain uh, tentative questions that are going to come for the examination literally memorize the answers and sit for the exam that is what is supposed to be the role of an ideal undergraduate and even in certain cases, postgraduate students. Some of you may relate, some of you may not. Uh, now in that context, a student is only expected to abide and follow the syllabus, not go beyond it. And I remember when I was trying to get conferences, this, that, this, that, I remember being subjected to certain scrutiny and criticism that, oh, your marks are not high, which is the second point that I'm uh, coming to. 
why are you going to conferences, why are you going to debates, why are you performing quizzes, and, and this and that, because your grades, no, no problem. Because your grades are not up to the mark. Why are you doing all these things? And I have to say, some of my elders were right, because they were concerned about my future, because I was in a structure which does not really give me much of a room to go beyond certain boundaries. Because the marking is so low that we cannot think of going beyond, because it is always syllabus, syllabus, syllabus. And when we try to do networking, it is seen as something of a, uh, to use a metaphor of the Marlovian overreacher, that you are supposed to be tied in the syllabus and you are going to conferences and talking to senior professors, which you are not supposed to be doing, and which is supposed to be left to the people in the elite academic spaces, so as to speak. Now, what are these elite academic spaces? Who are these people who are supposed to network? And as, as you may uh, be aware of, that there are certain class, class, gender, and all sorts of intersectional problems that is there in the Indian space as it is there everywhere in the world in different shapes or forms. And now that gets characterized into something that we Indians, uh, I, I don't want to generalize the term, but uh, I will do it for some uh, ease, is the understanding of merit. What is merit? There is nothing called merit or nothing called an IQ. It's just access. And that is what we will need research networking and support, which is not always there for pre-doctoral scenarios. I'm not talking about doctoral students because doctoral students are supposed to present in conferences. That is the need that they have prescribed in their courses. But what about master students? I have many master students, undergrad, let alone undergraduates, writing to me or speaking to me, saying, I want to present to a conference, but I'm so tense, I don't know how to do it because they have not been taught how to do it. Their curriculums don't support that kind of an infrastructure. Now, I don't want to say that everything is dependent on the administration or on the university campus. Because there are universities which have like hundreds of colleges under it. Not all, but some. Now, in a democratic setup like this, where there are people from the rural to the urban settings, and where like one department or one classroom has 150 to 200 students, it is not possible to give everyone research training. It is not possible to make everyone do a dissertation, because there is no time to check the notebooks. But what can be done is to give them a sense of motivation and encouragement, which I find to be severely, severely lacking. And that is why a platform, a community, is essential for better research practices, number one, to be inclusive, not just in the sense of intersectional, not just to be intersectional, but to include people from all age groups, be it old people, experienced people, and people who are young, UG, first years, who want to work starting out and get them in and give them their, that experience so they can proceed with what they want. Ethical citation. It is very important, I mean, Amy Earhart and Rupi Karisam and, and many other people talk about it, uh, about a citational, something they call citational justice. Uh, I think that the term citational justice may be from someone else, I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm mistaking it. Now, that is also very important because of something called citational metrics, H-index, and Google Scholar, and this and that that there are certain people who get cited more and certain people who don't get cited. And that is why when we perform inquiries and when we have community and when we are aware of the research that is going on in, say, metaphorically in the next room, we should cite them. Because if we don't cite our peers, no one will. And no one will get that, that amount of visibility. So it is from this sense of solidarity that I proceed to talk about what have we been able to do and by we, I will explore later on what we mean by we. Now, this thing started in, at ELO 2021. Now, I, now I, I apologize here that some of these activities here may concern in some shape or form my involvement, and I understand that how, uh, yeah, and I understand how that may be a little reductive, and we have been doing all these activities. I won't go into detail about all these activities because I will be sharing this slide in Discord, which will be open access, and you can access these hyperlinks to explore it on your own. So I will be just moving ahead. Now, what can we possibly do further? Remember the first 15 people who signed up that one year ago with that survey? I contacted them again, and I asked them these very basic questions. And these, these are the responses I got, that why did you join the group? Have you benefited? 
and what do you expect the group from moving forward? And all of these answers, if you look at the screen, correspond to what I was talking in the beginning. And the slide that I showed in the beginning was a slide I made in 2021 when the group was just made. And this is a survey that I did the, literally one week ago. So everything corresponds to the same need of exposure, networking, and engagement, let alone in which field you were talking about. And when we talk about we, who are we? Because if you're talking about electronic literature, I, I would like to highlight certain local communities as well, Electronic Literature India being one of them, uh, thanks to my fantastic peers, and LEI, which is headed by Roberta, who is also a part of this conference, and then MAELD and ADELD, which is headed by Johanna from Africa, and then of course we have the ELO. Now, for me, for a discipline, as, as Shamuga was also talking about, to move beyond a certain limit, I think it has to be a paradoxical situation where someone will work in digital literature and electronic literature and have no idea what electronic literature in India is about. They will work in digital humanities and have no idea what ADHO is about. And I think in that paradoxical situation, can an inquiry, a discipline totally flourish beyond uh, the so-called society, the so-called engagement? It should be a launch pad and not a cage. And before I finish, I would like to acknowledge some of these people mentioned. Anna, thank you for organizing this. Uh, my two fantastic supervisors, Dr. Dibul Piroy and Porichai Patro, uh, 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 our great president, Leonardo Flores, for him being active uh, on those uh, meetings that we have had, and he has listened to my rantings over and over again. Giovanna for organizing this and bringing us together, and last but not the least, Dina, without whom I literally wouldn't have been here. So, so yeah, we need all the help we can get. Uh, we need your advice on how to go forward and all the engagement that we can get. So please get in touch, get in contact, especially if you have been clicking pictures of me because I need them for my social media, thank you. Uh, and yeah, that's all. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, there's just one short presentation